Well, good morning to all of you. Um, I want to get quickly into our lessons, but very quickly. I uh, just want to remind you, if you are interested in, in and haven't had a chance to go through Verna's library, uh, this will be our last Sunday, your last opportunity to do that. So please uh, make use of that today. And also, um, just as uh, Mike announced, a uh, very important men's meeting today at three o'clock. I will uh, try to remember to get that link out to you when we get home and uh, discussing important things like uh, our Bible classes, uh, our live stream, how long we want to keep that going and, and if we want to keep it going. And so uh, we need uh, all the men involved in that. We want to hear from you and, and hopefully we can get a, a good uh, consensus as, as we move forward. I know a lot of people are, are uh, wanting to talk about masks and, and so forth, but we kind of feel like we need to get those things back in place with masks, making sure people are comfortable, and then we can have that discussion as well. So it's on, it's on our mind, it's been brought up, but uh, that's kind of where we're at. So thank you so much. So as we um, enter in, I wanted to give this little shout out, a little family shout out. Um, I think most of you know it, but uh, John and Dan Buttrey uh, have a little group, and they have these little in-home concerts of the classics, uh, rock and roll classics, the Beatles, uh, the Eagles, uh, all, all sorts of those uh, wonderful classics from our time. And um, uh, last night, I went to the, I, I can't believe it's taken me this long to get to one of their concerts, a lot of fun, and so... Um, I know they'd love to have you, and if you're interested in that, um, let me know, and I can, I can put you in touch with them. So, a lot of fun, and I know a lot of you have uh, uh, made use of that. So, today, um, I want to get into um, our study of the Gospel of John. When I talk about the Gospel of John, it's written like a, a piece of music, a crescendo, half the book leading up to this crescendo about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as we often say, um, <clears throat> John's gospel is he takes these elements, and that's the way we've been studying this. We're not studying it chapter by chapter by chapter, but we're looking at these different elements that John uses in, in which to... Um, Build faith in Jesus. And of course we know in John 20 at the end he says that I, I'm building this faith in Jesus that if you believe in him you have eternal life. But there's something that has to be added to that. And we want to add that this morning. It's not just about believing in Jesus and that belief in Jesus leads to eternal life. There's one more factor that John emphasizes through these elements, and, and especially in this next element. And so we're going to talk about now how, how John builds faith in Jesus with the conversations. Right, so I call it the conversations of John. And you can see in the, the little subtitle, we're going, to, we're going to look at Jesus' conversations with certain individuals. And so we call John's gospel the gospel of life. Well, we've talked about the first element. We talked about how we use these word pictures, these Old Testament word pictures, uh, water, <clears throat> bread, life, the shepherd, all these word pictures to build, drawing from the Old Testament, the, this uh, faith in Jesus as the source of eternal life. We talked about these seven hand-picked miracles. And in fact, there, there's more than that. But I understand when people say, these seven miracles. In fact, what our story today may not be classified as a miracle, but it is out of this world. And so now we're going to start talking about this element, and that is these conversations that Jesus has. Um, and, and these are broken down in two ways. Conversations with individuals, which we're going to start looking at, and then conversations with the multitudes, with the groups. And all of these reveal this what we are to, to believe in Jesus. And that's that, that one point that has to be made. It's not just about believing in Jesus that leads to eternal life. What John is emphasizing is believing in Jesus, the real Jesus, who he really was, what he really had a purpose in doing, what he stood for and what he didn't stand for. 
We can't just make Jesus into our own personal Savior based on our desires and our wants. We have to accept Jesus as he truly was. And that's what a lot of these conversations are all about. And so as we look at these conversations that Jesus has, there is going to be this pattern that develops. And it's a pattern we've kind of talked about. And it's a pattern of a disconnect. In other words, as we look at these conversations, Jesus is discussing, Jesus is conversing, and I'm going to put it this way. Jesus is, is talking spiritual. Now, he is talking about it in a, in a physical language, right? He talks about bread, he talks about water, and he talks about darkness and light, but he's talking about it in a spiritual way. And so Jesus will be talking spiritual, and the individual will be thinking physical. And so they, they're just not matching. And you're going to see that pattern. Because ultimately, when we build faith in Jesus, what, it, what that faith does is makes us understand that we need to be this new creature in Jesus Christ. We've got to be reborn, start over, and, and let Jesus and God form us and mold us into this new creature, which is what? A spiritual creature. This is what I've been emphasizing with the teens on Tuesday night's class, is that this new creature is a spiritual creature. And we've got to think like spiritual creatures. And we've got to act like spiritual creatures because our whole desire is to be where God wants us to be. You know, we've talked a lot about that. We're not where God wants us to be. When he created us, he put us where he wants us to be, but sin took us out of that. And so where God wants us to be is a spiritual place designed for spiritual creatures. And so... That's all part of this letting Jesus transform us into this spiritual creature by faith in him. This great passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Remember that statement where the, 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 the crowds were amazed at Jesus' teaching and they said... We've never heard anyone teach like this. So their rabbis and their leaders, what? They taught on a physical level. But Jesus taught on a spiritual level. It was different than anything that they ever heard. And I want to make this point as we gear our attention to these conversations with Jesus. This goal of becoming a spiritual being so that we're ready for that place where God wants us to be, that spiritual paradise. I don't know, Brothers and Christ, any other way to be a spiritual being than every day put spiritual things into our life. I've been a Christian for over 30 years. I've had Christ in my life in one way or another my entire life. But I still struggle living in a fleshly world and yet becoming a spiritual creature. And I don't think there's any way to become a spiritual creature by just putting day in, day out fleshly things. Fleshly music, fleshly entertainment, fleshly ideas, fleshly news, right? I'm not saying you can't have those things in your life, but there's got to be that balance and so every day, you've got to do spiritual things. You've got to put spirituality in your heart. Read God's Word and challenge yourself in that knowledge. Ask the questions. Have that, that biblical curiosity and, and intellectual curiosity. Um, listen to spiritual music and, and, and praise God through it. Have spiritual conversations and meditate on God's Word. Just, just a few things like that. But I think oftentimes we get distracted and that's Sunday, we do that Sunday, but Monday through Saturday it's spiritual things, or, or fleshly things and fleshly things. And we're putting all this fleshly into our hearts and into our lives. Yeah, that's going to be a distraction. That's going to be a barrier. 
And so it's all about building faith in Jesus, but faith that's going to make us a spiritual creature. Um, questions for, for you, questions for, for me. When you pray to God, do you ask only for physical things? It's okay to ask for those, but is that the limit? We pray that he heals our brother of a physical illness. We pray that he provides something physical for us. But when you talk to Jesus, do you only discuss things affecting your physical life? Uh, when you study the Bible, do you only relate to those things pertinent to your physical life? And, and I would imagine if we're honest that a lot of what we do is, is that. And we have to go beyond that. We've got to be spiritual creatures, spiritual thinkers, spiritual actors. So let's get into our text. If you would turn with me to John chapter 1, and we're going to spend the rest of our morning in this text, just diving into it. We set the foundation of what we're all about. We're going to look at this conversation. We're going to build faith for ourselves with that goal of becoming that spiritual creature. So as you're turning there, you know the introduction. John has introduced Jesus in lots of ways, lots of elements. He's introduced him as the Word in chapter 1, as the, the Creator, as the life, as the light. <clears throat> He's led us into John the Baptizer and, and taken us through that. And now we're at that spot where John the Baptizer has declared him another element, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he's trying to get his disciples um, uh, kind of away from him into Jesus, and two of them take the bait. They are Andrew and they are Philip. And Andrew is so convinced that this is Jesus, the Christ, that he goes and gets Peter. And now there's a, a, a little conversation with Peter, but it's so short, we're not going to really look at that. But then Philip, look at John 1, verse 43. The next day, Jesus purposed to go into Galilee. And he found Philip, and he said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, of the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Let, let me stop right there very quickly. Let me just say what we have here, and, and I, want, I want you to pay attention to this. What we have here is, Two of the, the first confessions of Jesus. Early on in the gospel. The, the, the first one here from Philip. We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets spoke. In other words, we have found the Messiah. And he confesses that to, to Nathaniel. And then Nathaniel says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Well, what we're going to have is Nathaniel's going to be led into the second confession. But notice it starts off with this. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip's response is, come and see. And I think that's a great, great point for us. That when we have maybe some type of, of disconnect, some type of disagreement with uh, our coworkers, with our friends, our neighbors, our family... Um, it, it's not about, hey, I've got to formulate some great response based on my experience, my knowledge. Sometimes the best thing is just grab a Bible and say, let's, let's see. Let's read it. I, I, I found that, that that works a lot better than me relying on, on my so-called expertise. That's powerful. I love Philip's method at come and see. He's not going to argue with him. He's not going to come up with this great oration, this great to Come and see. Let's open up God's word. Let's read it. And, it. and if you can't get your friend to do that, if they're not willing to do that, it's not on you. It's just that heart. It's not there. So now Jesus comes and Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and he said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no 
deceit. Some of your translations may say in which there is no guile. That's the idea. There's no deceit. There's honesty. There's sincerity. So verse 48, Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. There's the confession. And Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? There's the faith. You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. It's interesting how we get from, can any good thing come from Nazareth to, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel, so quickly. Did you notice that? One of the things that I try to emphasize when, when people ask, you know, how, how to study the Bible? How do I become a better Bible student? And, and I, I, I love that question because it shows me that, that desire to really know God's word on a deeper level. But there's two things I emphasize to people. Number one, don't forget the details. Look at the details. And, and let that story come out to you. Understand what you're reading in the story. A lot of times um, I'll have someone read a passage, right? And we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And I'll say, you know, how are we redeemed? And I, I'm just, just trying to get them to say, by his blood. Just what they just read. And a lot of times they'll say, well, uh, it's by his grace. Well, that's, that's true. But why, where did you come up with it? We didn't read about that. I, 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 want, I want you to, to look at the details and see what, what did you just read. And parents, I think that's so important to, to work on with your kids, that reading comprehension of the Bible. Yeah, we can have them read it, but are they understanding the story they're reading? Are they looking at the details? And as you look at the details of the story, I think there's some amazing things that come out as you look at the, the context itself and the book of John in itself. Number one, I think that John is telling us something about Jesus. Now, a lot of times we emphasize what, what, what we learn about Nathaniel, and that's good. But what, what we learn about Nathaniel comes first by what he learns about Jesus. And so early on, we have Jesus is the Word, He's the Creator, He's the Life. He is God. He was with God. He is, right? Now we're proving it. And so here we have Jesus displaying, I'm going to call it this way, the God ability. <clears throat> he can do those things that only God can do. And so all this comes up. The, the big change comes as Nathaniel and Jesus begin this conversation. And, and, and Jesus automatically says, before Philip called you, I saw you, right? He comes and says to Nathaniel, here's an Israelite in which there's no guile. He said, how do you know me? We've never met. And, and his answer, isn't that interesting? How do you know me? Before Philip called you, I saw you. And what happens? This leads Nathaniel to confess. <laughs> That's all it takes. You are the Son of God. Can any good thing come out? You are the Son of... We go from there to this. Like that. Does that just happen? To me, that there's a little more to this story and what's going on in this conversation. Because this conversation is, is pretty quick, a lot of times we just kind of read over it and say, okay, well, Nathaniel becomes a believer. But how does he get to that point? Let's focus on the confession. 
Let's focus on the confession a little bit. It's interesting, as I mentioned early on, how does John start the, the narrative portion, right? We've got these two disciples that were John's disciples. Now they're following Jesus. They're learning of Jesus. And what? They confess. He is the Messiah that the, the Old Testament prophets Moses talked about. He is the Son of God. He's the King of Israel. Just great, confident faith. Well, let's go to the, the end of the Gospel. Right? This Gospel is all about building faith that leads to eternal life. And what do you have from John 1 to John 20? Well, you have these stories. You have these elements. You have these conversations. And what do they reveal? Well, they reveal, as we talked about before, different levels of faith. People putting restrictions on Jesus. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, come quickly and heal my servant. We've got people that believe in Jesus. But not completely holy as they should, as they can. And that's that point. It's not just about believing in Jesus. It's about believing truthfully about Jesus, who he truly was. And so you get to John chapter 20, and we know verse 30 and 31, many other signs Jesus also performed. Uh, these are written that you may believe in Jesus, and by believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, you may have life in his name, right? But did you notice what comes before that? <clears throat> Jump up to verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them, when Jesus came, right? Jesus makes this resurrection appearance, but Thomas is God. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. And he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into the side, I will not believe. Now, I... I I don't know if you've ever made these comparisons, but compare Nathaniel to Thomas. Let's think about this. What leads Nathaniel to this great confession? To go from, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? That you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. It's this conversation about, I saw you under the fig tree. Most people believe that somehow... Nathaniel was under this fig tree and no one knew where he was. Nathaniel didn't tell anyone. He was under this fig tree. No one should have known. The only one that could have known would be God. And isn't it interesting that as Jesus says this, before Philip called you, I, he didn't say, I know where you were. What does Jesus say? I saw you. Most people believe that that's, that's kind of the understanding. That's what changed that. Jesus saw. Jesus knew where he was. No one else knew where he was. He was under the fig tree. Some of you might remember a couple years ago, I was uh, granted the great uh, privilege of, of doing a lecture for Florida College Lectures. And my, my theme was, or my, my story was, Jesus cursing the fig tree. And I told you, as I used you as the guinea pigs for that lesson, I, I told you I, I really didn't know a whole lot about fig trees and figs, and I had to learn all this stuff. And after that lesson, our own Phil DeCenci came up to me and said, you know what? Fig trees can get so big that you can, you know, they can like envelop you. You, you can hide in them. And I found this picture of a fig tree. And I was just like, you know, that, that just stuck with me. It, it, it was this great picture. I used that in my lecture. Thank you, Phil. And look, you can, you know, someone's in there. You're not going to see them, right? That could be what's going on here. So look at this. Jesus says to Nathaniel, I saw you. And if we're correct, what we have is this pattern. Jesus saw someone he wasn't supposed to see. Only God could see him. And that's the point. Now you go over to Thomas and what? Thomas is told by the other apostles. He wasn't there. The other apostles, we what? 
We saw Jesus. You're not supposed to see Jesus. Jesus is dead. But we saw him. Why? Because we're not supposed to. But he's alive. And that's the whole point, right? Tom, oh, I don't believe that. And what does Thomas says? Unless I see for myself the risen Jesus and the wounds. Is there, is there a, a comparison here? It seems to be. Over here with, with Nathaniel, you've got this, I saw you, and that just, that just changed everything. I guess there is something that, that is good that comes out of Nazareth. You are the Son of God. But then you get to the end, and you've got Thomas and saying, I don't believe. I'm not going to confess. And what happens is the very next Sunday, and this takes place on a Sunday, verse 26, chapter 20, verse 26, after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and this time Thomas was with them, and Jesus came to the doors having been shut, and, the, and, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands. And reach here your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. And now comes the confession. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Then Jesus, or excuse me, then John gets into these miracles and so forth have been, have been written. But it all leads in with Thomas. I think there's two points that can be made here. Jesus is saying the blessed one, the one that, that really Jesus is looking for is Nathaniel. You are the son of God. Just like that. That's the faith that, that, that saves. That's the confession that, that, that's going to save souls. That's the whole point. Is that the kind of faith you have? Are you the blessed one? Or do you demand, I have to see this, and I have to see this, and it has to be this, and it has to be that? Well, you might miss out on the greatest gift and the greatest opportunity in your life. Are you a Nathaniel? Are you a Thomas? You would think that the Gospel of John would end right here, right? What a great place to end. But he adds chapter 21, which is about what? Peter. Chapter 21 is where Jesus asks Peter three times, Do you love me? And I take it that that's in connection with the three denials of, Jesus, of Peter. Those three denials coming after Peter says to Jesus a confession. You are the Christ. You are the Son of God. I am ready to die with you. All the others may run away. I will not. And then what? He does. He, he denies Jesus. And so what is Jesus doing here? He's taking Peter who's weak in the faith who thought he was strong in the faith, and he's building him up. And then you get down to verse 18, and Jesus tells Peter how he's going to die. You're going to die at the hands of someone else. They're going to take you and lead you where you do not want to go. In other words, Jesus is telling Peter, you're going to die for me. And Peter's response is not like the confession Bring it on. Peter turns back and says, what about John? What about this guy? And I think that's the second point. People struggle with faith. They really should. It might be like, as we talked about, we're just, we've got too much of the world in us. We're putting too much of that in our heart, in our lives. 
It might be some struggle in your life. It might be some type of uh, character flaw that, that, you know, you got that pride, you got that arrogance that, that keeps you from seeing the humble Jesus. But the second point is, if you're that person, you still can get that. If you relate to Thomas, if you relate to Peter, you still can get there. But you better start taking a look at the evidence with an open heart, a humble heart. Do it now. Don't waste the time. You can get there. We all struggle. But Jesus is there and Jesus doesn't change. He wants you to become that spiritual creature. What a great comparison from the beginning to the end. Nathaniel to Thomas, Philip to Peter. And as we bring our lesson to a close, let's talk a little bit about Nathaniel and the fig tree. You know this statement, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? How do you look at that? I think most of us look at that as kind of, you know, a negative thing. He's looking down on the people in Nazareth. There's definitely kind of that stereotype in the Bible. When Jesus goes there, he's not well received. They want to kill him. Jesus says a, a prophet is without honor in his hometown, Right? But I, I want to, and I understand that, and I think some of that's true. But I want to look at this statement a little differently. Because when Jesus comes to Nathaniel, he doesn't say to Nathaniel, you've got some things you need to change the way you look at people. He compliments him. Here is an Israelite in whom there is no guile, in whom there is no deceit. And I think another way of looking at this statement, can any good thing come out of Nazareth, is that Nathaniel was such a spiritual person that he, he wanted an Israel that was spiritual, not fleshly. An Israel that was open to a spiritual Messiah and yes, he demanded a lot of his brethren because he demanded a lot of himself. And so he was disappointed in his brethren at Nazareth. I think that's the way to look at this. But as we move on, what is it that changes his view of at least Jesus from Nazareth? Well, as I said, most people think about, the. well, it's because Jesus is able to identify the location. I saw you under the fig tree. And I believe that's true. But again, let's look at the details. I think there's more to it than, than that. Because Jesus doesn't even, doesn't just know you're under the fig tree. He knows what time he's there. He says, before Philip called you, he knows what time. He could point to the very fig tree. He could point to the clock and say, I know exactly when you were there. And then, what about this? <clears throat> An Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Why, why does Jesus use those words? As the opening words to this conversation, all the things he could say... He says that, is he just like, kind of when we're talking about marveling at the character of Nathaniel, marveling at his faith? Maybe that's it. But I think there's a real possibility that he says these words in relation to, I saw you under the fig tree. In other words, I think he's saying, I know what you were doing under the fig tree. Most people believe that Nathaniel was that he was praying he was meditating he was doing something spiritual like Jesus who got off on his own and spent time in prayer Nathaniel went off on his no one knew where he was and he's under this fig tree 
And what? In complete honesty. He's praying. He's meditating. He is sincere. He is spiritual. And, and I think Jesus' words here reflect back to that. I know where you were. I know what time you were there. And I know what you were doing. That's the Jesus. And yet so many times we try to hide stuff from Jesus. It's going to come out. Let's just lay it at his feet. And say, I need your grace. I need your mercy. I need your strength. I am weak. I am no one without you. Merrill Tenney in his commentary takes an interesting view of this. He believes that Nathaniel was under the fig tree and he was not only meditating, he was thinking about the story of Jacob recorded in Genesis chapter 28, where Jacob is at Bethel, the house of God, right? That's what that means. And he names it that. Because what? This is the first night after he what? He deceived his father and took the birthright blessing from his brother. And now he's fleeing for his life. And that first night after doing all that, who comes to, to Jacob? God does. And he makes a covenant there with Jacob. And Tenney's view is why... Uh, Nathaniel was asking God, why would you do that with Jacob, who is a deceiver? In which uh, there was a, a patriarch that had guile. And you think, well, where does he come up with that? Well, look at verse 51, Gen John 1, 51. Look at what Jesus said. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Where's the first time we see that? Angels going up and down from heaven to earth. It's that story. Focus on the details. And you start to see things that maybe you don't see by just reading through. I think all this leads to Nathaniel understanding the power. When Jesus says, I saw you. There's something to that statement. And I think these details help us to understand how we get from, can any good thing come out of Nazareth to, you are the Son of God. So in the end, John is telling us something about Nathaniel, something about Nathaniel that comes when he tells us something about Jesus. How long did it take for him to believe in Jesus? Not very long. How quick is our faith? Are we a Nathaniel or are we a Thomas? Do we struggle in our faith because we make demands on Jesus that we shouldn't? What does it take to believe? Spiritually. Not just that, that Jesus can help us in this physical life. He can. Praise God for that. But he came to this earth to help us with more than that. To make us that new creature. To make us a spiritual being. And if you haven't confessed Jesus, how long will it take to get you to say you are the Christ, the Son of the living God? Because when you truly believe that, then you know there's nothing I can do to make my life better, to make better decisions in my life. Jesus is much better equipped to do that. That's why we give it over to Him. That's why it's not about us. Because we believe it not from a fleshly level, but when we say you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, it's the spiritual reality of that. 
And if anyone's ready to make that confession, we want to help you become that child of God. Let's go ahead and sing a song. And anyone that wants to do that, just let us know. And, and we'll make your obedience complete.